Hello, my name is James Barrett. I'm a researcher and teacher in Humlad at Umi University. I work between the Language Studies Department and Humlab. Humlab is a digital humanities computing lab and studio. In the last few years, I've been involved in a number of projects related to digital media and pedagogy in Humlab. Some of them are involving virtual worlds. At the moment, I'm speaking to you from one of two islands that Humlab has in Second Life, where we continue to maintain a creative and teaching presence. Some of the other projects that we've been involved with are related to augmented reality and also online media, uh, writing for the web, this sort of thing, blogging, social media. I would like to just share a couple of these projects with you under three inclusive themes. Learning in Focus, Three Threads of Practice. We'll start with looking at an example of how we work with the idea of making space in Humlab. Historicizing public space with QR codes is uh, a short visual account of a course that we're teaching in Humlab. It's running for the second time now. That's the fall term of 2013-2014. These photographs are from the previous course. It's working with the Department of Culture and Media at Umeå University and we're working with museum study students. The project is about finding students working in groups, finding a space or place in Umeå where they use QR codes. In the full term of 2012-2013, a group of museum study students at Umeå University in Sweden were challenged as part of their course to make a museum installation in a public space using quick response or QR codes. This is a short photo essay of the results. The students found spaces or places and then they had to justify why they chose these. They then had to do research looking at these places or spaces in relation to a set of themes that the course lectures and classroom time and written assignments were centred around. These were gender, sexuality, class and religion. Once the students had researched these spaces or places, then they had to build a digital online archive that could be accessed through mobile devices using QR codes. Of the 2012-2013 group, some of them chose the historical side of these places. Some looked at the uh, ideas or themes or intentions that were included when these spaces or places were created. Strompilan is a shopping centre in Umeå. Uh, it was formerly a factory space, part of the structure is a restored factory. And the students who worked with this group, with this project, um, looked at class issues between the factory and the shopping centre, looking at how employment and labour and economy had changed. And then they represented their findings or their research in relation to the place itself visitors could access this information by scanning QR codes that the students put out in this place. This is an example. The thinking behind this is that by placing an information layer over this place, then we create a sense of place, an information-rich environment that people can access, and in a sense we historicise that place 
and bring about a set of relationships that most often are found in a museum, but they're in a public space and people can connect with that as a place, as a history, and related to the identities and events that happened there. Another project that was undertaken by the students was the statue fountain that is at Umi University. These projects are shown in January in Umeå and temperatures can drop as low as minus 30. Van Orts Parken is a park in central Umeå with a long history. The students that worked with this project chose to create a fictional character, which is the ghost of a boy, a teenage boy, who, when the visitors entered the park and scanned the codes, through audio and images they encountered the character who then led them around the park and told them the story of the park and the events that had happened there. Volkspel is the fountain statue at Umi University that I mentioned before. All the URLs that I'm showing you in this presentation are still active and can be accessed online without the QR codes. Skarinska Villan is a popular venue in Umeå. It's a historical building, as you can see. At the time that the students conducted this project, there was an argument going on about the space, about the place. It's been uh, rented for uh, concerts and events for a long time. It's seen as being part of the straight edge culture, which Umeå is fa famous for. And the students that worked with this project looked at both the historical building, what has happened there, and the role that the building occupies in Umeå culture and society today. The second theme that I wanted to mention today was learning place. Oh. HumLab has been involved with Media Places, a project in conjunction with Stanford University. And the idea of Media Place or Media Places beyond the project that we have going with Stanford is, is a very big concern in HumLab. It's something we talk about a lot. My own involvement with the idea of a Media Place, I think, began with my work in virtual worlds. I started working with Active Worlds in 2003 when I first came into Humla. I've been working with a number of other virtual worlds, online virtual worlds since then. But in the time that I've been working with virtual worlds, I've really expanded the concept of it. I don't see it as something that you log into a three-dimensional graphic space online that is shared by other users, is persistent, that you know you log in and it's still there when you log in again next time. And people can own houses and drive cars and interact with other avatars and that sort of thing. I think a virtual world is actually more than that. And that's why I begin with this image of Borobudur in Java. A beautiful sculpture, a huge structure, and in many ways a virtual world. The idea of place or places, I think, relies on architecture, agency and actors. And these, in virtual spaces, these are completely achievable. You can have a place in a virtual space. And an early example of this is Amsterdam Online. The Digitale Stad is 1994. DDS has 15,000 accounts. It's Howard Rheingold's speaking about it in 1995. People have occupied the city with their home pages, they have their own usenet, news group hierarchy, a new interface they demonstrate creates a visual representation of the digital city divided into town squares, literary areas of interest. Literally areas of interest. People look at the information in different areas, can choose to represent their presence with their email address and a small GIF. It seems quaint now to think about this. Today, Virtual Amsterdam in Second Life is a graphic three-dimensional space populated by avatars. 
Another example of creating space and place with virtual media is Arden, the World of Shakespeare. It was a short-term project where the creators attempted to have a recreate the spaces and places of Shakespearean drama. Rome Reborn is an ongoing project where the city of Rome is recreated in a virtual space on a particular day in AD 320. Virtual prayer evening took place on the 21st of September 2008 where avatars logged into Second Life and engaged in prayer in churches built inside the space. Religion and Virtual Worlds is an ongoing research area in Hume Lab as well. One of my colleagues, Dr. Stephen Yelfgren, is researching this. The uh, Big Pond um, application from Australia has closed down now, but at one stage uh, they had a representation of Uluru, known to many as Ayers Rock, Inside the virtual space it was near a pub, of course, but when this was created, representatives of the traditional owners, the Anangju people, warned that even with restrictions it may be possible to view sacred sites around Uluru, although they were continuing to investigate the issue. It was considered that the Anangju people wanted the, the virtual Ayers Rock closed down because they felt that it was uh, intruding on their own spiritual beliefs related to the rock. I thought this was an interesting issue, this idea of virtuality and reality, the separation between the two. I think as digital media becomes increasingly efficient, fast and augmented, it operates outside the box of a computer, we're going to have to renew our understanding of, of what is virtual and what is real. This is a still image from a project that we conducted in Humlab. It's part of an ongoing artist in residency that we have in Second Life, where a real artist, often quite a well-known artist, will apply and be granted a three-month residency on the Humlab island, where they can work, create things, uh, run experiments, meet people, talk, do teaching, uh, deliver seminars, all within the virtual space. The second life, so they don't actually travel to Sweden to Home Lab to do this. Garrett Lynch was one of the artists that we had in residence on the Second Life Island, in, and uh, he conducted a number of uh, performative pieces. This is a still from one of them to a walking, not running, and getting nowhere. In this piece, Garrett combined Google Maps with his avatar and a number of webcams where he moved, in his own body, he moved around his neighbourhood. The visual um, image of what was under his feet while he was walking was streamed into Second Life. As his avatar walked, it walked over the terrain that his body was walking over. And you can see that in the Google map here. While audio from where his body was was also being streamed into Second Life. I thought what was interesting about Garrett's pieces were that he was actually questioning the concept of place. Again, just returning to the Ayers Rock Uluru, they've got a scenic lookout group photo pose where, just like it, the actual Uluru, there are special places where you're allowed to take pictures because there are regions and parts of the rock that are sacred for the indigenous people. This is a poster from another artist, Alan Sondheim, who was an artist in residence, the Second Life Yoshikaji, up in the air residency. The residency is organised by Sachiko Hayashi, a Japanese-Swedish artist, who's been working for a number of years with Humlab. This is uh, Bodhi Island in Second Life. It was a large island that was devoted to teaching, speaking and archiving about Buddhism. Again, the idea of prayer in a virtual space, 
This is one of the mosques that are in Second Life, and you can see an avatar performing a prayer. The final theme that I wanted to talk about in this film, which is a sort of a summary of everything I've said up to now, is narrative as interface. The idea of narrative as interface comes from an early text by Nick Motford, actually his master's thesis from 1995, where he said the interface controls the reader's interaction with the narrative. He was talking about interactive storytelling. But I think that basic idea can be maintained today even in the most complex of digital texts. And this is an image from the upcoming game Watch Dogs, which people are anticipating Everything is connected. Connection is power. The idea of this narrative as interface, I think, can be traced back to Renaissance perspective. The idea of space, place, perspective. And this is an image from Sebastian Celio from 1545, where he constructed images of the city. I think this is the city as tragedy. But you can clearly see the Renaissance Quattrocentro perspective at work in this image. And that's an ordering principle. A next significant stage in the development of perspective is uh, Velasquez's famous painting La Minas from 1656. The painting La Minas shows a large room in the Royal Alcazar of Madrid during the reign of King Philip IV of Spain. It presents several figures, most identifiable from the Spanish court, captured, according to some commentators, in a particular moment as if in a snapshot. Some look out of the canvas towards the viewers, while others interact among themselves. The young Interfanta, Margaret Teresa, is surrounded by her entourage of maids of honour, chaperone, bodyguard, two dwarves and a dog. Just behind them, Velasquez portrays himself working at a large canvas. Velasquez looks outwards, beyond the pictorial space, to where a viewer of the painting would stand. In the background, there is a mirror that reflects the upper bodies of the king and queen. They appear to be placed outside the picture space in a position similar to that of a viewer, although some scholars have speculated that their image is a reflection from the painting of Velasquez is shown working on. Whatever the structure of the image, the effect is that perspective is challenged and the viewer is included within the narrative structure of the picture by virtue of gaze, depth. Likewise, Cezanne's painting includes the viewer because it is a deconstruction of an image to its points. It's not a complete image until the viewer puts it together as a series of surfaces in planes, abstraction had this effect. The image is broken down into surfaces, paths, shadows, distances. This was perhaps the beginning of the end of academic composition, following the low established rules of perspective. Heavily influenced by Cezanne, several young artists were soon to radically break the mould and themselves become major influences on 20th century art. These would include Picasso, Duchamp, at the same time that the visual image was being broken down into a set of constituents that required a position for a viewer in order to complete the structure, language was also being used as an interface in literature. Many commentators and critics trace this back to Tristram Shandy, the novel. But you can also see, I've identified in my own research, She by Ryder Haggard, featuring the shard of Amenartus, where Haggard had his sister create a pottery shard, which he was then inscribed with Greek and Latin. And he used this object as a start of a narrative story, his novel She. James Joyce is well known for working with language as a material structure, Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake are two examples of this. Virginia Woolf pursued similar interests and goals with her writing. 
the one that I've looked at the most is the novel Between the Acts, which is an intense uh, stream of conscience and also material uh, encounter with language. Gertrude Stein, The Making of Americans, perhaps her most famous work, where she worked on language as, as a structure, as an object almost, a sculptural field. She worked with words, repetitions, rhythms, sounds, phonemes. Samuel Beckett, similar. In the 1950s, the American writer William Burroughs and his colleague Brian Geisen resurrected some of the practices of the Surrealists, beginning a cut-up method working with sound and image. Milord Paverick, the Dictionary of the Khazars, another example, often cited by digital scholars, where a book, the Dictionary of the Khazars, was written about a fictional people, and it's encyclopedic, it's ludic in the, the fact that the reader has to wade through entry after entry about these fictional peoples, or fictional, it's a fictional dictionary, but they put together in such a way that information has to be combined by a reader in order for it to become a narrative. Jorge Luis Borges, book Aleph is another example of this language's interface. Julio Cortazar, his hopscotch. And finally, the most recent example, Daniel Danilowski's House of Leaves, where the reader has to combine and search through a text in order to construct a narrative. The visual, returning to the visual image, Moybridge, Edward Moybridge, his famous for his work on animal locomotion, 1877 and 1878. Some of the earliest filmic images of motion saw this uh, motion as a representational field, bringing motion, action, and the um, cause and effect that you can see in motion or action being brought into a representative field, that of film, newly discovered medium at the time. And skipping forward through a lot of stages of film development, just looking at how the image and movement and action are combined in order to include the viewer in the field. Um, I use here an image from the Orson Welles film, The Lady from Shanghai, 1947. Here you see film has moved from representation to interactive world. The visual language of films has altered to the point where today we participate visually and spatially in narratives as perspectives. The narrative film is now a world. We move from game to sequel to book, often in 3D spaces, and with characters we return to again and again. Perhaps the best example of inhabiting a film as a space is machinima, the making of film using computer games and virtual worlds. This is a reference to one of the most famous machinima, Blue versus Red. That's made with the Halo game engine. It's a series that was first commissioned by MTV, where characters speak through the avatars from Halo. Augmented reality is now being increasingly used to mediate urban spaces. This is an example from the London Museum, where an app has been created. You move around present-day London, you hold up your iPhone, and you can see spaces and places as they looked before, often related to historical events. Uh, this is um, World War II London superimposed over present-day London. And then returning to virtual worlds once again. Since 1999, a number of courses have been run in HumLab that use virtual worlds as spaces for learning, from linguistics to language learning, virtual spaces for art production, and the teaching of even pharmacy. These courses teach students to deal with aspects of working life, as well as teaching critical concepts grounded in material relations. The idea of critical making is a key concept in uh, HumLab. I don't have the time or space to elaborate on it here, but as well, the idea of simulation combined with virtual worlds has strong pedagogical possibilities, which we've been exploring in HumLab. Finally, I'd just like to end on the idea that separation is ceasing under the, the banner of narrative as interface. You can see that both the representation and the action or the interpretation and the interaction are now 
joined within digital media due to feedback loops that programming can create and also the mobility of this sort of media. I've just got a few examples here. An example of this interaction, meaning, feedback is Console Yourself. It was a production, theatre production that was done by Skoog Theatre, the Shadow Theatre in Umeå, and uh, Humlab, working with the game artist Niflis. Audience participation controls the actors, the choices actors make through your body, an audio tracking game interface. Uh, we hacked uh, Connect from the uh, Xbox platform and then used this uh, body tracking software and uh, audio tracking for the audience to be able to manipulate actor choices during the theatre production. It was very successful and popular. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, this is my email if you'd like to get in contact. Thank you for listening.